lovely to have here, you here, David. So passing it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Shirelle. Um, hi, everybody. And um, lovely to speak to um, so many of you. And indeed, it is just a little after eight o'clock in, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, I'm at home. Um, on a, you know, the, week, the week has started. Uh, Sunday's a working day. And um, uh, it's a pretty frenetic period in Israel. I'm going to talk quite a bit about politics. I'll try and talk about some other aspects of our reality as well. And as Shirel, um, my second cousin once removed, um, um, put it, uh, we'll have plenty of time for, um, for questions as well. Um, now, there's a lot of you, and I, I assume, you know, all kinds of, of Israel expertise from, you know, thoroughly expert to, you know, less so. So forgive me if I say stuff that sounds obvious. And uh, uh, hopefully, there's, I, I won't be saying stuff that's, uh, that's, that's hard to follow. Uh, this is a very small country. Uh, it's nine miles wide at its narrowest point. Uh, my wife is from Texas. And Israel fits into Texas about 30 something times over, eight times into Florida, New Jersey sized. Uh, wh why do I start by saying that? Because uh, when you're a tiny little country, you have you know very little room for maneuver and you have to get a lot of stuff right. Uh, we're on the western edge of a um, somewhat toxic um, um, land mass, I would say, and I'll talk a little bit about this. We've got um, more peace agreements and normalization agreements than we had not very long ago, um, but so there are pl plenty of hostile um, players very close to us um, on both our northern and our southern borders. You have the Iranian um, armed and inspired and backed um, I would say an army in, in the case of Hezbollah on the Lebanon border, across the Lebanon border, and you've got a, a, um, a, a terror entity uh, in Hamas-controlled Gaza. So it's uh, a pretty precarious area. Uh, nonetheless, um, as Israel marks about 75 years of its modern existence, uh, the country has been thriving. It hasn't merely survived, it's thrived. Um, and that's an astonishing feat. And it's thrived as... Um, a Jewish and a democratic state. That was kind of the foundational, um, well, those were the foundational values, core values as set out in our Declaration of Independence. Um, and it's been a bit of a mini miracle, really, uh, in that uh, we have uh, 77, 76, 77% Jewish majority, the only place on earth where the Jews have ever been sovereign, um, certainly the only country with a Jewish majority. Uh, the last time I checked, the, the next one was Gibraltar. Um, with, you know, maybe two and a bit percent uh, Jewish population. So this is, you know, the only Jewish majority country, um, which favors, makes it easier for people to take citizenship here um, if they were broadly speaking Jewish enough to be persecuted uh, by Hitler. Uh, I think people sometimes forget that Israel has served as a refuge throughout its modern existence. It was uh, revived, I would say, too late uh, to ser serve as a refuge from, uh, from Nazi Germany. Uh, but it has ever since it was uh, um, declared independence in 1948 in the middle of a war. People have been coming here both because of choice, um, as I did, for example, um, or because of uh, necessity, including from countries where you would have thought people didn't feel a necessity. Well, you know, one of the biggest components of, of Aliyah in the last few years was France, where some people moved here from choice and some people moved here because they, they felt they couldn't lead proudly public. Uh, Jewish lives uh, where they were, and they they felt they needed uh, um, to come to Israel to to fully express themselves. Um, it's uh, an extraordinary country. Uh, it used to be the land of uh, of Jaffa oranges. If you'd fly into Lod Airport now, Ben Gurion Airport, uh, you'd fly into runways in the heart of groves of olive trees. There, there still are, uh, but not as many. And Israel transitioned from an agricultural economy, from the the land of the the kibbutz. Uh, to a to a pretty capitalist um, country um, with uh, a, an incredibly strong focus on tech. And maybe it's worth talking just a little bit about that because there's some ast astonishing aspects and facets to Israeli tech and innovation. Um, you know, the, there, are, there are characteristics of Israelis that I think have helped um, galvanize this. This used to be, we used to call it the startup nation and still is. Uh, the only reason I would, I would add the caveats is that kind of implies little quirky things. And Startup Israel became now uh, uh, um, a much more scaled up Israel. It's got companies that have real impact and innovations that have you know, profound impact uh, in tech and also in, in, in medicine, for example, 
uh, you know, at the Times of Israel, we do a, a fair amount of, of medical and science reporting, and it's rare for, you know, for a week to go by without some kind of very significant study or some kind of significant breakthrough. Uh, the, the capacity for innovation in this country is astonishing. And part of that, I would say, is, is a function of the army. I wouldn't say it's the only thing. Uh, the first thing is our education system, I don't think is terribly good. And I've, um, you know, we've had three kids go all the way through it and, and, and far beyond. I don't know when they learned the stuff that they now know. I'm not convinced that it was in the school system, but somehow we turn out um, pretty smart and capable and self-sufficient people. And then they do the army. You know, most Israelis uh, do military service. Uh, it used to be three years for men and two years for women. It's kind of been e equaling up a little bit. Uh, the men's period coming down a little, the women's period going up a little bit. Uh, not everyone does the army. Uh, but nonetheless, that means, and if you think about yourselves and your kids and your grandchildren, the stages that they are at life, um, Israelis aren't rushing from high school to university. It's not like you finished your degree at 21. Really not. A more common experience, like my eldest, for example, finished school, went to a pre-army academy for a year, um, which is kind of preparation for army, but also preparation for life. Um, then did three years in the army, then spent a couple of years basically recovering from the army and then went to university and he studied architecture, um, if you're interested. And that was five years at the Talel. So by the, by the time he started actually earning a living, he was, you know, coming up on 30. Um, so I don't know um, all the implications of that, but among them, you're going to school later. You maybe have a clearer sense of who you are and what you want to be in terms of work. And you've also, if you've served in, in a, a fairly serious army capacity, you've probably had to take some pretty life and deathy kind of decisions. You've probably had to improvise in critical circumstances. You've probably lost much of, a, of, of any fear of failure that you might have had. And some of those factors are, are, are big advantages in a, in a world of tech, where when you try stuff and it doesn't work, that's kind of part of the process of innovation. And there's a, that's a very Israeli thing, you know, okay, it didn't work, or okay, they said you can't do this. Well, maybe we can do it. Um, and that's, you know, the number of Israeli companies that have flourished, you know, not certainly on the first effort at something innovative, but have tried and tried again and haven't felt it was dishonorable to fail. Um, it's, it's pretty large. And I meet quite a lot of groups that come to Israel from overseas. And one of the, the, the parts of the world where people come to Israel uh, from and look especially at tech is the Far East. There are lots of people who come here from the Far East and they're not coming to Israel because they think Israelis are smarter. Because I don't think I don't think they think we are, and I don't think we think we are. But they're trying to work out what it is, you know, what's the sort of special source that has enabled Israel to thrive um, as well as it does in in tech. And part of it is uh, is is that it's the no fear of failure thing. Uh, okay, they say it can't be done. We're going to try it anyway. Uh, it didn't work. Well, we'll we'll try and 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 rethink it. And is there a better way that we can do this? Uh, and that those are factors in in Israeli tech. So tech is thriving here. Um, the downside of, of some of this is that we have, you know, like I said, we used to have, um, I suppose, a fairly socialist economy. Uh, and now we have a pretty um, firm uh, capitalist economy. And we have a widening gulf between the sort of the haves and have nots. And just again, to be very personal, I'm running a, a journalistic enterprise. My hardest thing in the 11 years that we've been doing the Times of Israel has always been staffing. And you have to really want to go and do journalism when if you've got language skills and writing abilities and you can do anything that relates to tech, you can earn a, a much better living. And that applies in, in many, many fields. You know, anybody who's got a, a tech connection is working in tech is going to do fairly well, economically speaking. And lots of other people in, in you know, all kinds of professions, certainly all the service professions uh, are left behind in a country with quite a high cost of living. Uh, there was a period when Tel Aviv was, was considered to be the most expensive city in the world or one of the most expensive cities in the world. Uh, it's expensive, uh, and some people can manage, and some can't, and that's one of the one of the problems that we need to address here. Uh, tech is driving the Israeli economy forward. It's really, really important. We need to do better in uh, in, in trying to ensure that uh, that our people don't get left behind. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the region, and then I want to come on to the politics. So, uh, like I said, tiny little country, nine miles wide at its narrowest point. Um, I'm in Jerusalem now. People, I mean, I'm sure most of you know this, but just, you know, the, you know this is where I tell groups. You, you flew into the airport, and where did you go? Did you go to Tel Aviv first, or did you go to Jerusalem? Oh, we went to Tel Aviv first. And how long did that take you? Well, it was about 20 minutes, I think, on the bus, they say. And I say, and after that, that's the ocean. That's the whole story. So you went west for 20 minutes. That was the whole width of the country. And then you came to Jerusalem. And how long did that take you on the bus? 
from Tel Aviv, about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. So that's the whole width of the country at that point, because if you go east of Jerusalem, you're in disputed territory, you're in the biblical Judea and Samaria, you're in the West Bank. And after that, it's Jordan and some hostile countries like Iran further to the east. So the whole width of the country at the, at the place where you come in at the airport is basically an hour's drive across. And there are parts of Israel that are, like I say, nine miles, so you know, 15 minutes across the width of the country at its narrowest point. The undisputed or ostensibly undisputed sovereign Israel. Uh, if, if you're in Jerusalem like I am now, people, and you, you know, I ask people how far do you think Gaza is from Jerusalem? And if they're in Israel for the first time and they didn't do their pre-trip reading, you know, they certainly won't guess that it's 75 minutes from Jerusalem. And they won't, uh, you know, they won't appreciate until they get here that you know, the Syrian border is four hours away and you cross that border at your peril, likewise the Lebanese border. The distances are so short here uh, and therefore they impact, like I said before, our room for maneuver, um, you know, we have very, very little margin for error in this part of the country, in this, in this country. Now, a, a rare non-pessimistic part of, of what I'm going to say, um, we've um, tripled our peace agreements to, you know, I'm, I'm kind of being a little um, over generous there. But in the last few years, we used to have, you know, peace with Egypt. We made peace with Egypt in the late 70s with an astonishing peace agreement, um, uh, you know, Begin and Sadat. Um, brought together formally by, um, by the Carter administration. And um, we thought that that was the, the great breakthrough, that you know, the, the rejection of the notion of a revived sovereign Jewish entity, um, the fact that that taboo had been broken, that, e that Egypt was prepared to come to terms with Israel. Uh, I think many Israelis thought that that was the beginning of regional acceptance of Israel. Egypt was such a powerhouse state in the Arab world. I mean, it still is, but it was even more uh, a dominant state in the in the region, and uh, you know, if you want to go into the psychology of this a little bit, after the Yom Kippur War, you know, the humiliation for the Arab world and especially for Egypt of the '67 War, and then the the regaining of self-respect um, with the the very terrible War uh, of '73 uh, gave Sadat, if you like, the the confidence that that Egypt had kind of proved itself against Israel, and he was able to make peace with us. But the Arab world did not follow suit. The Arab world basically boycotted Egypt after that. It took till 1994 for King Hussein of Jordan, who'd always been sort of quietly supportive, uh, to make peace, to sign an agreement with Yitzhak Rabin. Um, and those were our two you know, essential peace treaties. They still are. Uh, our longest border is with Jordan. Our relationship with Egypt is incredibly important. But um, towards the end of the Trump administration, uh, I would say three and a half um, peace, processes were, peace processes were culminated, one with the United Arab Emirates, uh, which, was a, which was and is a full normalization, uh, with Bahrain likewise, uh, with Morocco, which is um, of particular significance because there was and is a Jewish community there and there was a real you know, sense of, of, of a revived connection uh, with, with Jewish communities. So it's, a very, it's a powerhouse uh, peace treaty, I would say, and a process that's still unfolding with Sudan, our foreign minister was just in Sudan last week and there's talk about maybe that agreement will be finalized by the end of the year. I think there was optimism that it would go faster, um, but still uh, that process is moving along. That's a very comforting. Uh, on the other hand, as I mentioned before, you've got Syria and, um, and Lebanon, which are pretty hostile to Israel. Um, you've got um, uh, the endless friction of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, both in the West Bank and in Gaza. And then further to the east, you have Iran closing in on a bomb um, and nobody guaranteeing what Iran considers to be rational if it were able to achieve a nuclear weapons capability in terms of just the, the simple deterrent capability and the capacity to wreak harm, which uh, Iran is already doing in this region. If they have a nuclear weapons capability, it's of a whole different order. And therefore, for a long, long time in Israel, we've had this dilemma about how do you tackle Iran? Uh, and, uh, you know, are there going to be agreements that constrain Iran? And if not, is it going to fall to Israel to intervene militarily? Uh, I'm sure lots of you are familiar with lots of this uh, process as it has played out. Um, maybe the best take on that is, I mean, um, among the, the, the key takes, first of all, Israel does not want anyone to have to militarily intervene in Iran. Um, and, and a lot of the friction with the Obama administration was the, I, would, I wouldn't say consensual, but widespread Israeli conviction that the deal that the international community led by Obama um, cut with Iran in 2015 was not a strong enough deal, that it didn't um, dismantle the Iranian program and it didn't prevent them 
uh, from advancing in terms of research and in terms of practical capabilities as well. Um, the Biden administration came into office after Trump had withdrawn from that deal, talking about r restoring the deal and seeking a sort of longer, stronger deal. None of that has happened. Um, I think Israel and the United States right now are fairly close in terms of uh, the level of concern about Iran um, and uh, maybe even quite close in terms of what may need to be done. Um, you know, less said often uh, is, is, is relevant here. Uh, but there's a lot of military drilling going on, um, in, including just a few weeks ago, the biggest uh, American-Israeli um, drill, including, I, I have to kind of be careful about what's being confirmed and what's been reported, uh, but apparently including um, a fairly serious simulation of attacks that uh, might be seen to be relevant in an Iranian context. Um, you know, very, very close coordination. America reorganized its kind of military um, um, areas, con control areas in such a way that Israel and countries like Saudi Arabia now uh, kind of have banal and unremarkable cooperation simply because they're in the same American um, military area. So there's all kinds of interactions there. Uh, and there's a concern that, uh, I mean, I think the Biden administration, for now at least, doesn't think that Iran is prepared to come back to a, to a nuclear deal that would have any teeth. And therefore, you know, if Iran keeps moving forward uh, and there is no diplomatic uh, means of stopping them, uh, Biden has said he prefers the diplomatic option. Uh, gradually, the military option becomes the only option uh, as a means of stopping Iran. That's not what we would like to happen. We would like a deal that keeps Iran from the bomb credibly. And, uh, and permanently, that, that possibility is looking increasingly remote. So that's something to take you know, very, very seriously, I would say. Um, I, I wanna talk now about, cause I have to, uh, about Israeli politics. Um, so we're um, one, two, three months, November, December, January, that's right. Three months after our fifth, fifth election in, in, in you know, four years or so. Um, and the first really definitive election, which is why we had to keep having them until we had a definitive election, uh, we now have a coalition government with 64 seats out of the 120 in the Knesset. Um, so it's 64 to 56. And that may not sound particularly um, uh, decisive, uh, but that's a big majority by Israeli standards, especially as the 64 who are, um, I would say, right wing, far right and ultra orthodox parties are relatively, by Israeli standards, like-minded, spectacularly like-minded by comparison with the previous coalition, whose only common cause was their effort to try and keep Netanyahu out of power. But on the left to right political spectrum, they range from you know, pretty, pretty firmly right-wing, including sort of strongly pro-settlement parties, all the way across the center into the Zionist left. And there was even a fairly conservative Islamic party in that coalition. So that was about as diverse a coalition as we've ever had in Israel. And now you have a pretty um, like-minded um, right-wing, far-right, ultra-orthodox coalition, as I said. So 64 um, members of Knesset who, broadly speaking, so far uh, are indicating that they'll, 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 they'll vote together credibly. And 56 in the opposition who are far less united, by the way. Um, so the, even the 56 isn't reliable and you're up against 64. So a very strong coalition led by Netanyahu uh, who waged um, a, a really effective election campaign. Uh, you know, as a politician in Israel, he's peerless. Um, that's not automatically a compliment. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that. You know, we have pure proportional representation in Israel, which means very few votes in theory of, are, are wasted. That's a lovely system. You know, think of the American system where in many states people you know, kind of know it's not worth going to vote in presidential elections because their state is so obviously one color or the other. Think of Britain, where you can come second in 600 and something constituencies and not get a single seat in parliament. You know, those things, you know, they don't, they don't happen here in the same way. Broadly speaking, you know, votes count. Almost every vote counts. And here's the thing. Netanyahu in the elections on, no on November the 1st made sure, indeed, that almost every vote that could have been for his block would count. And he did things including um, brokering agreements on the far right for three parties, pretty extreme parties in, in my definition, in my definition, uh, they, could, they were able to run together as a kind of technical block to make sure all three of these factions cleared the only barrier 
to pure proportional representation, which is a threshold. If you get three and a quarter percent of the national vote for your party, you get your share of the Knesset seats. So he made sure that none of the parties that would support him fell below the threshold, including by merging these three far right parties. And therefore, almost every vote for a Netanyahu led coalition counted, whereas on the other side, there was much more disunity and political incompetence and I would even say sort of misjudgment and arrogance. Um, significantly, two anti-Netanyahu parties, uh, Meretz, which is the most left-wing Zionist party on the Israeli spectrum, most left-wing, you know, relatively uh, widely supported Zionist party, uh, they fell just below that three and a quarter percent threshold. And an anti-Zionist Arab party also fell below the threshold, having got a lot of votes. Something like half a million votes uh, went to waste there. If you look at the popular vote in these elections, in other words, the actual ballots cast, it was a pretty much 50-50 call. But because of that threshold and those wasted votes in the anti-Netanyahu camp, the disunited anti-Netanyahu camp, Netanyahu emerged with that 64 to 56 um, majority. And you know what we can say is until the election, he did what he felt he needed to do and was able to do to make sure he won the election. And you can say, but that doesn't mean he was necessarily going to you know, ally with all these people who he helped get into parliament. What I think is very significant in trying to judge this coalition and where it's going is what Netanyahu has done since he put the coalition together. And that's very recently. So the elections were on November the 1st. The coalition was only sworn into office on December the 29th. So we're talking just a little bit more, you know, a, a, a month uh, a, a, a few days ago. Um, the coalition that he put together included all those far right factions. He wouldn't have had a majority if he hadn't brought them in because none of them uh, would have gone in without, without the others, I suspect. But not only did he bring them in, he gave immense power to the leaders of these far right parties. Um, he had said before the election that the finance ministry and the foreign ministry and the defense ministry would all remain in the hands of his Likud party. But when he conducted the coalition negotiations, in fact, he gave the finance ministry to a man named Bezalel Smotrich, who is the leader of a um, one of those far right factions called Religious Zionism. So he gave one of the most important coalition uh, cabinet positions to somebody not in his Likud party. And his Likud is the biggest party in the Knesset. So you wonder why he really thought he had to do that. Not only that, he also gave Smotrich a junior job, same guy, as a, as a minister in the defense ministry. OK, not the defense minister, but a minister in the defense ministry. Now, there has been in the past a second minister in the defense ministry, but there was never a situation where that second minister also controlled the country's purse strings, which gives incredible leverage and influence. Um, and, and there's a situation now which I which has no precedent, as far as I know, where the army is basically publicly acknowledging, at least in the case of the, the until recently chief of staff, that it's troubled by the political oversight of some areas of its jurisdiction. So, for example, uh, the chief of staff of the army until a few days ago, a, a man named Aviv Kochavi, said publicly that he's not going to answer in any way to Smotrich as that second defense minister. He's only answering to the actual defense minister. And then a second leader of a far right party, a man named Itamar Bengvir, of whom probably many of you have heard, um, certainly an extremist in, in my opinion, a former disciple. I think he would probably acknowledge still being a disciple of uh, the racist Rabbi Meir Kahana. Uh, he would say I don't, he doesn't follow everything that Kahana stands for. He used to uh, advocate for the expulsion of Arabs from Israel. Now he, quote unquote, only supports um, the expulsion of Arabs. Somebody, I assume him, uh, deem, uh, deems disloyal. This person who's had uh, multiple convictions, including for incitement to racism, is our minister of police. And not only is Mr. Benvir the minister of police, he's a minister of police with unprecedented powers. He has more control over more areas of running the police force than any of his previous minister, uh, any of his predecessors. And among the things that it's not entirely clear to me if this has come to pass yet, but in theory, he has control of something called the border police, which is a kind of quasi-military uh, um, hierarchy, uh, some of whom are, are deployed in the West Bank. And Kochavi, the chief of staff, 
has actually said publicly that if Mr. Benvir sets a kind of different agenda, and Benvir has talked about wanting to ease the rules for opening fire, for example. So Kochavi said shortly before he handed over the job as, of running the army, that if the border police uh, are run with a kind of different conception from the army, he simply won't deploy them in the West Bank. And he said, you know, I'll have to use more uh, combat troops from the standing army, so they'll get less training, but what can I do? Well, I'll have to use more reserve forces, because I, I can't have two sets of Israeli forces being deployed and in action with two different kind of oversight mechanisms. Now, if that sounds confusing or bizarre or, well, that's what it is. And like I say, I've never heard uh, a, a chief of staff speaking in that way where the army, which is the, you know, the, the operational arm of, of the democratic government, the army is trying to maneuver so that it feels it is acting professionally and properly. And Kochavi says legally, he says, as far as he understands Israel's um, quasi-constitutional basic laws, the army is only meant to answer to the single defense minister. So there's some quite radical stuff. There's more that I could say, and you can you can draw me out more on this if you want to in the Q&A. Some of the, the, the ministerial appointments are, um, I would certainly say, and it's me who's giving this talk, other people would give you different uh, uh, presentations, I'm sure, very troubling in terms of the potential directions uh, that some of these extreme influential ministers will try to take Israel. Netanyahu assures everybody his hands are on the wheel. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. Maybe the most important um, issue I should talk to you about in terms of politics, and in terms of where this coalition um, insists that it is heading, um, is um, that literally six days after the government was sworn in, Netanyahu's justice minister, a member of his Likud party, Yariv Levine, unveiled proposals for what he presented as the first stage, only the first stage of what he called judicial reform. Now, these proposals, as uh, Levine has set them out, uh, I don't think that uh, reform is um, uh, uh, an appropriate description for them. At the very least, they're an overhaul. And I would submit that essentially they amount to the almost complete neutering of the high court in Israel, uh, the, the withdrawal uh, of the court's capacity to serve as a break, um, B-R-A-K-E, on government, on, on the political majorities, any abuse or excess in any field, any impingement on um, individual rights, minority rights, and so on. Why do I say that? First of all, uh, the, the nature of the proposals uh, drastically reduce the, the capacity of the high court to strike down legislation or government decisions that it deems contradict Israel's quasi-constitutional basic laws. Basically, the court, if these proposals go through, won't be able to stop the government doing anything that it thinks is, un that they think are undemocratic, except under the most exceptional circumstances. Not only that, if they do manage to strike down a law or a decision, broadly speaking, the political majority can simply re-legislate it again afterwards. Not only that, under these proposals, the justices will be deprived the legal measure that is called um, reasonableness, the, the sort of measure that you use to, to, dis, to decide if something is proportionate and appropriate and so on. They won't have that legal measure to use. And finally, not the only thing, but the final one I wanna highlight is the uh, proposals um, uh, intend to remake the committee that selects justices in the first place to give essentially, although they don't say this, but that is the consequence, to give the political majority of the day, a majority on the panel that chooses the judges. So you're limiting drastically what the judges can do to rein in political excess, and you're gradually gonna be changing who, who the judges are in the first place. Now, why is that even more drastic and dramatic than it sounds? Because as I said, the High Court is really the only break on um, executive abuse and, ex and excess because in Israel, we don't really have three branches of government. Uh, you know, we do have a legislature um, as well as the executive and as well as the judiciary, but the legislature, the Knesset, is essentially a rubber stamp when, as is the case today, you have a like-minded coalition. The Knesset can't stop anything going through that the government wants to get through. You've got 64 solid votes and you've got 56 arguing people in the opposition. So whatever, and really I would take it even further, 
whatever the prime minister wants to do, broadly speaking, his coalition will back him with, broadly speaking, and certainly anything the coalition agrees that it wants to do, goes through the cassette very smoothly. We're already seeing this happening. And if it's something outrageous, it's only the high court that could stop it, and they want to stop that happening. Now, there are people... Um, including the attorney general, who's the chief legal advisor to the government and also the head of the state prosecution. Um, she has said basically that this is um, placing uh, untenable um, power in the hands of the political majority. It radically uh, unbalances the separation of powers and the balance of power and so on. The president of the Supreme Court has basically said that the, the coalition is treating the, the high court as though it's the enemy. Uh, and is trying to neuter it. So you've got the judicial establishment, you know, very, very publicly, extraordinarily uh, opposing, not the whole idea of reform. Um, there's no argument, I don't think, there's not much argument at least, uh, that there is room for reform in the Israeli judicial system, including, by the way, um, it's it's an incredibly strained system. Uh, and the, you know, the, the, the whole, the actual process of justice, the wheels of, of justice turn, you know, incredibly slowly in Israel. Um, members of the opposition have advocated in the past uh, for reforms, including uh, a limitation to some degree of the rights of the high court to strike down legislation, a more nuanced process. But um, this is, you know, by people who are opposed to the coalition, I would say, this is not seen as reform. And what you've had erupting in the few weeks that the government is in power are large protests every Motzei Shabbat, every Saturday night. Um, it's hard to get a fix on the numbers. The official numbers, I think the biggest demonstration a couple of weeks ago was said to be in excess of 100,000 people in Tel Aviv. Uh, there are people who think that the numbers are underestimates um, and all sorts of calculations um, to, uh, to make that assertion. Not only public protest, however, but also concerns, like I say, expressed by lawyers and, and you know, serving and past members of the judiciary. No great surprise there, perhaps. Economists increasingly warning um, that this is going to do terrible harm to the Israeli economy. Um, in, in many, many other fields, uh, including the beginnings of protests from the security establishment, um, concerns that this is changing Israel from a, a, a thriving, feisty democracy into something uh, there are all kinds of uh, designations for it. There are people who are arguing this would constitute regime change, um, a, a constitutional revolution, a constitutional coup, all kinds of terminologies like that. Very, very drastic and particularly stunning, given that until relatively recently, uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu was a big public champion of the independence and potency of the High Court. Uh, he is now on trial uh, in three corruption cases. and. You know, a lot of the focus is, well, this is him being able to wriggle out of his trial if he can get all these uh, changes through. The court would be powerless to prevent various processes that would uh, enable that his trial you know, falls apart. I have to say that's part of the picture. Uh, he could do that more easily than with a, with a radical shift to the capacity of the high court. Uh, I'm not wanting to give him any ideas here. He could fire the attorney general. Uh, it wouldn't be straightforward. There'd be, you know, it's it, none of this is necessarily going to be straightforward, but he would then have to contest that in the high court. Uh, if he was able to appoint a new attorney general, a new attorney general could re-examine the charges against him and assuming that he'd chosen an attorney general for the task, uh, potentially dismiss the charges against him. By the way, I'm not even sure that he would be convicted in his trial. I'm certainly not sure that it's going to come to a head anytime soon. Could go on for years. So it's not only the specifics of why this might help him in his trial. If you're asking me, there's a whole psychological part here as well. And I think a lot of it, or some of it at least, is he's convinced that he's been framed. He's convinced that he's done nothing wrong, either that he didn't do what he's accused of or that he did it, but it was entirely reasonable. And he thinks, you know, now I'm getting really into... Um, Un, unprovable uh, um, psychology here. His father was kind of um, um, a, a, a leading academic who felt, and I think with some reason, that he never received the um, recognition um, and um, resonance that he deserved because uh, an elitist establishment uh, was not comfortable with his brand of academia. And I think Netanyahu, um, feels that kind of this, this elite has come for him. Um, he also feels that this country is lost without him. 
He considers his political rivals pygmies. Uh, he thinks he is um, peerless in terms of um, ensuring Israel's well-being. By the way, I think most of Israel's prime ministers become convinced of that, that without them, the country is lost. I'm thinking maybe Yitzhak Shamir didn't think that, but maybe he did. Um, but maybe he didn't. Uh, but it's a fairly common um, um, trait, I think, among Israeli prime ministers. So he, he thinks the country needs him to survive. He thinks the foolish elites have, have uh, combined to stop him, and he'll do whatever he needs to do to ensure he remains in power and the way he sees it, uh, to ensure that he can continue to protect and defend, defend Israel against, and basically anybody who's a critic, against the left, the left the judiciary, the cops who had the temerity to investigate him, the, the weak attorney general, his words, uh, who decided to prosecute him, the media who are all out to get him, the politicians in the opposition who are all out to get to get him. So that's where we are on this. And it's really a very, very difficult period for Israel. Um, opposition in the last few days, we've had people on the left talking uh, about um, implying, shall we say, at least, um, uh, some kind of support for the use of force. I don't even want to give full expression in a in a call uh, to some of what's been said. If you read the Times of Israel and other places, you'll know what's been said. So incredibly irresponsible and insightful with a C statements on the left. Now, remember, we've already had uh, our own prime minister assassinated in Israel in 1995, Yitzhak Rabin, by a right-wing extremist. Uh, there are some deeply unfortunate, and I'm putting it very mildly, uh, expressions against Netanyahu in the last few days from people on the left, which under, undermine um, the, the, the protest and the opposition, uh, which has sought to not just be left-wing opposition and has sought to not just be secular opposition. But the more that you have outrageous comments from people at these demonstrations, the more you're going to alienate people who might otherwise be very concerned about where Israeli democracy is headed. Okay, I promised Shirel that I would speak for no longer than 30 minutes, so I lied, um, and that I didn't need 40 minutes, but that's what she gave me, so I've taken it, and um, that's so 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 much for the overview, and now steer this conversation, please, wherever you wish. Perfect. Thank you, David, so much. That was uh, a lot a lot to get into 40 minutes, uh, and thank you for making it so clear. I'll remind those of you who want to ask questions to please put them in the chat. And I'm taking them from there. We already have quite a few. So maybe just to touch, um, start with Netanyahu and this question of how is it even possible that he uh, ran to elections and become a PM with this trial uh, uh, over him? Uh, and is it, you answered a little bit about the, if he can be found guilty or not, but how is it even possible that this is um, the case? Okay, it's a really good question, uh, especially as um, the well. The bottom line is there's a, there was a lacuna uh, in Israeli legislation, and you should read more widely about this because I'm not the world's expert on Israeli uh, on 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 the specifics of this. But the big picture is as follows: um, it, it was not explicitly stated that an Israeli prime minister would have to step down if he was indicted, um, uh, and therefore. Um, in the absence of a definitive uh, legal position, um, because Netanyahu was, first of all, under investigation, well, for sure he could carry on. Uh, he's not the first prime minister who's been investigated. Uh, he was able to carry on in that role. Um, he he um, was then indicted, and a conflict of interest agreement was worked out between him and the state prosecution, uh, in which he was allowed to um, remain in office as prime minister, run for office as prime minister, again, because it was not explicitly forbidden under Israeli law, provided in this agreement he didn't um, um, act in any way as prime minister um, uh, um, with legislation or, or other decisions and so on, that would impact his trial. And therefore, the question is incredibly um, relevant right now. So you've got a Netanyahu-led coalition that is trying to blitz legislation through the Knesset. That certainly has potential ramifications for his trial. And therefore, in the last few days, you've not only had the attorney general issuing a very, very long legal paper advising that the uh, the overhaul is undemocratic and, you know, in layman's terms, dreadful. Uh, but you've also had the attorney general advising Netanyahu, reminding Netanyahu that he's bound by this conflict of interest agreement. And therefore, he should not be involved in any legislation, planning of legislation, 
um, steering of legislation, framing of advocating for uh, that would affect his trial. And, uh, and therefore, that's just one other area where we now have uh, the prime minister and his coalition in direct conflict um, with the uh, with the judicial hierarchy. One other thing I should say, you know, elaborating on that and and um, and other things that I've said, I don't know how any of this is going to play out, and I don't think anybody else does definitively because we've never been in this situation. If you think about what I said, which is that the coalition is trying to blitz through Parliament legislation that would, broadly speaking take away most of the high court's powers, it can be reliably expected, because that's why the court is there, that people will petition the high court and say, hey, you have to strike down this legislation that is gonna you know, new to you because it's undemocratic. And it can be reasonably expected that the high court will say, absolutely, we quite agree. This is, uh, I mean, you've got the attorney general who's basically indicated that she will not represent the coalition if there are petitions in the high court, she won't defend the coalition against petitions against this legislation because she thinks it's indefensible. Uh, so what happens if they get this legislation through the Knesset and the high court strikes it down? Okay, now now we should have silence because I don't know what happens. You know, does the, does the coalition then, then say, well, we've decided it anyway and therefore the court has no relevance and when it decides something, we won't listen. I don't know. Netanyahu said the other day when the attorney general said, reminded him of the conflict of interest restrictions on him, he said he doesn't accept her, her, um, her um, reminder. So it's not an absolute all out um, complete conflict on that issue yet between them, but we're already pretty close to it on that. So I don't know how this is going to play out with all the ramifications for Israeli democracy that I've discussed. Thank you. So another question regarding this uh, judicial uh, reform or overhaul. Um, if you can say a few words about how judges are usually appointed and how uh, it's supposed or how they're aiming to change it and what would be uh, the problems maybe or significance of choosing judges and approving them by the Knesset. Uh, that's not the plan isn't that they would be approved by the Knesset. There will still be a, a selection committee. Um, and it will be slightly expanded, and it's the balance within that committee that would change. Um, as things have been, essentially, and again, um, look carefully at this, and we've covered it, you know, our, our good legal reporters have, have covered, covered it well as well. Essentially, at the moment, uh, neither representatives of the judiciary nor representatives of the uh, political majority have been uh, able to steamroller appointments through the committee. You needed a degree of consensus. In the amended um, composition of the selection committee, as proposed by Netanyahu's Justice Minister Yariv Levine, it, in one form or another, uh, representatives loyal to the coalition majority um, would have a majority on that panel. And therefore, the political majority of the day would be able um, to um, get its candidates elected even if the members of the judiciary on that panel uh, objected to them. So it's a, it's, it's a change of the balance in the selection committee. There are other aspects, and maybe that's what the question was also picking up on, uh, hearings in front of the Knesset and publicly and so on, but they won't be the point. The point would be the choices would still be made in this selection committee, and that committee would be rebalanced to give the um, coalition a majority. It's, it's, re it's a good point, point to make in terms of stressing the recognition among critics of the government that there's room for reform. Uh, again, there are people in the opposition now who have advocated for some adjustments to that selection committee, but not adjustments that give the political majority of the day essentially the capacity to choose its, ju its judges. And one more thing I should make, uh, one point I should make because I'm speaking to lots of you who are in America. So people say, well, but the whole system of politicizing, uh, the whole system of choosing justices is, is avowedly political in America. What's wrong with having that in Israel? So I would just, uh, I would direct you to the, um, the Attorney General's um, comments from just a few days ago, where she listed all the reasons why um, the, the politicization of the judiciary in Israel uh, would be uniquely um, undemocratic, as she saw it. You know, we don't have a um, uh, um, uh, Bill of Rights in Israel. We don't have two houses of parliament. Uh, we don't have 
a, um, a constitution, for goodness sake. We have these quasi-constitutional laws. As I said before, we don't really have a legislature with an independent capability when the executive is, is like-minded and has a significant majority and so on. It's the combination of factors. You know, one of these, one of these factors on its own, and certainly lots of these factors in a, in a, in a less drastic way, would fall within the, uh, the framework of nuanced reform, if they were being debated, if the opposition was, was being heeded, uh, there would be much less concern. Right now, tonight, literally a few minutes before we started this call, um, the justice minister said he's not delaying his reforms by even a minute. And the president of Israel, Isaac Herzog, urged the coalition to pause this process and said, you know, Israel is entering a really dangerous period here. We need, we need to stop. We need to talk. We need to debate this. Now, the president in Israel is a largely ceremonial position with kind of moral weight. And Isaac Herzog is a pretty consensual figure. I think he was elected president with the greatest support of any president in the history of Israel. It's voted by the Knesset. He's a fairly consensual figure, as I've said, therefore, he's saying, don't do it. And certainly don't do it this way and don't do it this fast. You know, the, the former head of the Bank of Israel was, uh, was on television last night, a, a Netanyahu appointee, a world renowned, a world respected, at least, economic figure saying, hey guys, you know, we're trying to warn against disaster ahead. He was talking from an economic perspective, the way the world looks at Israel, uh, the way the world would come to regard Israel, and by extension, uh, the readiness to invest in Israel, Israel's credit ratings, and so on. You know, lots of very, very credible non political figures. And I, I have to say, the most resonant, of course, being uh, and the, the president, this, you know, he's Herzog is a former leader of the Labour Party. It's not that he doesn't have a partisan history, but in his role as the kind of state um, symbol of consensus and, and above the, um, the hue and cry of partisan politics, today saying to the coalition, guys, this is getting really dangerous. We need to be talking to each other. This needs to be done more patiently. He warned last week that these reforms and the process by which they're being undertaken threatened to consume us all, I'm quoting him. And he also noted that in biblical Jewish history, we never got past 80 years of sovereignty. I didn't even know that. Uh, I, I knew the first temple stood for a few hundred years, but evidently, I'm sure he knows much more about the, the period of sovereignty. He's saying, you know, we're, we're not even at 80 years again in this modern incarnation. We better make sure that, uh, that, we're, that we don't tear ourselves apart. So, you know, this is pretty dramatic um, uh, days that we're going through. Um, okay, I'm going to try and tie a few questions in before we pivot to more questions regarding American uh, jewelry and whatever, everything that's going on here. Um, if you can uh, say a few words about how this judicial uh, situation uh, kind of splits left and right, what issue, daily issues it might impact, and how, where is it leaving us in terms of our relationship with the Palestinians and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I'm just tied all of those in. <laughs> you know, this is it's a very important question. Um, so, again, sort of anecdotally based, including on, on opinion polls and, and so on, broadly speaking, if you didn't vote for a Netanyahu coalition party, um, you're probably opposed to these uh, reforms. Um, I would say that within the Netanyahu coalition, uh, there are probably um, a fair number, it's hard to quantify, although there have been surveys, but I, I don't know how reliable any of them are. Uh, if you voted Likud, uh, you're probably uh, more likely to have some concern than if you voted for parties to the right of the Likud and for the ultra-Orthodox parties. Um, and part of that moves me to, to the second part of the question, how would this play out? Who's it being you know, directed against? So, for example, um, you said Palestinians. So in the past, the High Court has has barred the state from legalizing settlements built on private Palestinian land. Well, if the court can't knock that down, you could do that. Uh, previously, the High Court has limited the capacity of the state to codify in law that ultra-Orthodox young men don't need to serve in the army or in any kind of national service. Uh, that is quite widespread, but it is not fully codified in law uh, because the High Court has considered that to be um, overly discriminatory. So if the High Court can't intervene, um, you would have a formal wall-to-wall, um, -wall, if necessary, exclusion of ultra-Orthodox young men from military service. Uh, another ultra-Orthodox uh, issue, uh, the leader of Shas, um, uh, the Sephardi ultra-Orthodox party, a man named Arya Deri, 
went to jail uh, for bribery a few years ago, served his time, served a seven-year uh, break from uh, public life, as he was required to do, came back into politics, was convicted a year ago uh, for tax offences, um, quite complicated, um, um, and he uh, negotiated a plea bargain. The judge in the case understood Derry to be promising to withdraw from public life. Derry insists he made no such promise. Uh, he was resigning as a Knesset member for an interim period, but he was never withdrawing from public life. After the elections, which he led Shas, um, he joined the Nisanio coalition as expected. And he, he was the deputy prime minister, which is symbolic, not significant, but symbolic nonetheless, and the interior minister, which he's done before, and the health minister. Um, and the high court said well, that's unreasonable in the extreme, um, unreasonable in the in the legal uh, meaning, and also uh, invoked something called estoppel. I'm sure there's some lawyers on this call who had heard of that uh, before two and a half weeks ago. I first heard about it at four o'clock on the Wednesday afternoon when the high court invoked it to say you can't benefit um, from promises you made in one case um, by abandoning those promises. Uh, further on down the line. So the court, first of all, said, you you know, it's radically unreasonable to have a recidivist criminal um, uh, sitting as a minister. And as far as we understood, he promised that he was not going to be uh, uh, active in control of public funds. And that's why uh, a lower court accepted the plea bargain. Again, high court intervening very directly. Um, that's something that um, uh, the ultra-Orthodox parties in this coalition would be very happy to see rendered impossible. Um, there's a, um, a clause in at least two of the parties' coalition agreements that proposes that legislation be passed that would make it legal to refuse to, to provide a service um, for someone on the basis of it contradicting one's religious beliefs. Um, one of the proponents of this legislation has said that, uh, as far as she's concerned, it could be used by doctors uh, to refuse treatment to um, uh, people that they don't want to treat on condition that there was a reasonable equivalent um, uh, service available uh, in, a, in a geographically viable location. Another of the proponents of this legislation has said it could be used if hotel owners didn't want to have uh, LGBTQ people staying in their hotel. This provoked outrage, but it's there in the coalition agreements. Does that mean it's going to become law in Israel? I can't tell you, but it is supported by at least two parties in the coalition. And it is specified in their agreements with Netanyahu's Likud. So in terms of who would be you know, pleased by some of this stuff and who would be displeased by it. But I would add that that's only half the picture, because everything I've said is from the point of view of the current majority coalition. If some of these reforms, quote unquote, go through, as I said before, all individual rights of anybody uh, are potentially at threat. Uh, by an abusive majority, you know, by the same token that in theory, some of the things that I described could happen, well, you could have people saying, we refuse to provide service to ultra-Orthodox people or to, you know, to, to women or to basically anybody. And therefore the potential ramifications for rights in a democracy are incredibly far reaching. Okay, so I think that answered that question, I hope. Yes, uh, I'll pivot to uh, some uh, U.S.-Israeli-Jewish relations, uh, and if you can comment uh, on two things. First of all, uh, the kind of sentimental relationship, shifting relationship, um, especially in light of now having people from Israel turning to American Jewry and asking them to intervene after many, many years of saying, keep out, you're not living here, and what's the shift uh, in that balance and how you view it? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, um, and it's a, it's a bit of a shift. Um, I'm not sure that the people um, who are saying to uh, American jury you should weigh in um, were people who would have said American jury should never weigh in. Um, I, for example, um, feel very strongly that ultimately it's the people who live here um, and who live with the consequences who should be making decisions when it comes to Israeli diplomatic and security policy and so on. Uh, I do think that when it comes to matters of, of global Jewish concern, there needs to be a, a richer dialogue than we have here. Uh, and there are lots of people abroad who, who, for whom Israel is, is profoundly in their heart and soul. And I always encourage them to help uh, make the best Israel that they know how to make. Uh, you've got more explicit um, um, 
entreaties to American jury uh, to weigh in from a, from a very mainstream Zionist perspective, including because of concerns by Israelis for the well-being of Israel. You know, if you care about Israel, well, one of the problems that we're going to have if we've got a neutered high court is it's going to be much, hard, much easier to, um, to give Israel massive grief via the UN and, and uh, by, via bodies that are deeply hostile to Israel. The BDS movement, I, I'm sure, is delighted and will be delighted to see some of these quote unquote uh, reforms going through because one of, the, one of the best defenses Israel has mustered in the UN when the international community has challenged its policies on the Palestinians, for example, has been to say, listen, Israel has a very active, fairly liberal, entirely credible high court. And when governments have tried to do things that did not appear to the uh, high court to be um, appropriate given Israel's um, uh, foundational principles, the court has intervened. I'll just give you a really little example. When Israel bought, built the security barrier um, to try and help stop the second intifada, the onslaught of suicide bombings uh, in, in 2000 to 2003, the original route of that barrier took in about 13% of the West Bank, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And in Israel, Palestinians have the right, they had the right in that context to appeal to the high court. So Israel's high court heard appeals against the routing of a barrier designed to stop terrorists being able to drive down the road and blow up Israeli shopping malls and buses and so on. Uh, and the court rerouted the barrier. Uh, so instead of about 13%, it takes in about 7% of West Bank territory. I mean, there's, there's lots of nuance and complexity to what I'm saying pretty fast, but this was the, the high court weighing Palestinian concerns, Palestinian access to lands against Israel's most you know, urgent and, and, um, and vital security interests. I mean, what is the responsibility of government? It's first and foremost to look after the well-being of, of, of its people. The high court found that there was room to uphold Israeli security concerns, but in a way that was less drastically affecting at least some uh, affected Palestinians. You know, those arguments that Israel and, and Israel's defenders have been able to make uh, would be much weakened um, if, you know, if this uh, process uh, goes through. And therefore, um, I mean, therefore, first of all, you saw on his visit here just the other day, you saw Tony Blinken. I, I don't think, you know, America uh, can can absolutely lecture to the whole world about, you know, being the best democracy and how democracy needs to run. Um, so, you know, but even within that context, you had Lincoln at least twice, maybe three times in his short visit, listing principles of democracy uh, and saying that the relationship between the United States and Israel has always been founded on shared interests and shared values, right? Shared values is a big deal thing. You know, if we're not going to share uh, or e even aspire to share some of the core principles uh, at the heart of those shared values, Blinken was saying, he didn't make any threats, uh, but he was indicating that the relationship's gonna be different. And, and since you know, American Jews are hugely invested in, in relations between, a, in a strong bipartisan relationship between the United States and Israel, since Israelis, are, you know, I, I don't wanna say it's an existential relationship, but it's, it certainly can be argued that it's an existential uh, relationship, that this alliance is, you know, critical to Israel, that's why you hear people, there are other factors as well, but that's also why you hear people saying to American Jews and not saying, you know, abandon Israel, boycott Israel, heaven forbid, the opposite. Uh, if there's a way in which you can convey concerns, if you feel concerns, you know, convey them because something to, to many minds, certainly including mine, something very, very troubling is potentially unfolding here. Thank you. I mean, it's time, but if it's okay with you, I'll ask two last questions. One sure. little big and the other smaller. So one, did this government present or do we know where they're heading towards in terms of uh, Israel-Palestinian uh, conflict and what the thoughts are? And have they also presented anything about uh, asylum seekers and refugees? I know those are huge. Um. So on asylum seekers, um, again, it's a case in point where the, the High Court has intervened in the past in terms of, of rights and what the country can and can't do, uh, can and can't do. It's, I, I'm sure there are, there are clauses in the coalition agreements that relate to this. I mean, there are, those are huge documents. I don't think it's a front burner issue because um, after you know, some years in which, because we were the sort of only overland um, democracy, accessible democracy for people um, in countries to the South, 
uh, we had lots of people crossing a pretty porous border. Um, and the, the border has been, it, it might sound implausible that our border with, you know, Egypt, which is an ally, but still, you know, we have a history there. It was not a, it was not a hermetic border by any means. There's that, that flow has radically decreased and therefore um, it's not a front burner issue at the moment. Uh, I, I would imagine that this coalition would be fa fairly uh, tough on um, economic migrants. Uh, Israel in, in recent years has been fairly tough, even with um, less hardline government than this, and I wouldn't think that would change. On the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is indeed a, a, a huge issue, um, it's early days, and I don't want to say anything definitive. There's material in the coalition accords, and the first uh, clause, I think, of the actual um, coalition guidelines, as opposed to the individual parties' accords, spoke about um, the land of Israel and Jewish rights in this part of the world. Some of the parties in this coalition are avowedly supportive of annexation of the entire uh, West Bank, the entire biblical Judea and Samaria, some of them without any uh, significant, um, anything like equal rights for Palestinian residents of that area, um, and you know other nuances along, along the road there. Um, it, I think you'd, you'd say at the moment, uh, you'd have to say that the jury is kind of out. I mean, we're only a few weeks into this coalition. Uh, it's not clear um, how dramatic um, any sort of move towards annexation would be and where Netanyahu would stand on it. Past performance, I mean, Netanyahu wanted to annex all the settlements and the Jordan Valley, about 30% of the West Bank in total. And he thought he was going to be able to do it with the support of the Trump administration. And when Trump unveiled his vision for peace, um, what was that, three years ago, uh, Netanyahu thought, OK, and he, and he said, I'm going to be able to do this now. Uh, and the Trump administration made clear that actually, no, there would not, there would not be support for Israel uh, annexing chunks, unilaterally annexing uh, chunks of the West Bank. And then along came the United Arab Emirates with an offer to normalize ties and widely believed, although not specified um, in the agreement, was a commitment from Netanyahu not to annex parts of the West Bank for well, maybe three years. We'll see how I don't think uh, um, the UAE would be uh, hoping that that would change in the near future. Uh, Netanyahu chose an agreement with the UAE and Bahrain um, and by extension, some of the other processes that are still unfolding, including with the Saudis, over annexation. So the Smotrix and the Ben Gvirs would want him to annex. In the past, Netanyahu has foregone annexation in the absence of a supportive American government and chosen normalization processes. You know, you might say to yourself, okay, maybe he's gonna wait out the Biden administration and think there will be a more supportive administration to follow, supportive in terms of annexation, or maybe, maybe not. So it's too early to say, certainly elements in this coalition would want to encourage annexation. And he has empowered the leaders of some of those parties. But even in the, in the clauses in the parties' agreements with him, where there is mention of annexation and encouraging annexation, there is always a little clause that says, in accordance with the, with the prime minister's position or a subject to the prime minister's approval and so on. What's, what, the reason I spoke so much about the judicial overhaul is in, in those same agreements, you know, this quote unquote reform of the judiciary is marked down as a priority. It's backed by every party in the coalition. We can see that unfolding. Uh, on the Palestinian issue, uh, things are, are, are certainly less definitive. Thank you. I'm gonna end with a slightly kind of political personal question. Uh, there was a question here about the difference between uh, calling uh, the area the West Bank and Judea and Samaria. So I want to tie that in with asking a little bit about your own evolution in terms of your uh, political views and where you stand uh, and stood in the past and how that might have changed and where you stand today. Okay, so that's a nice um, um, personal question to end with and I'll do my best. Um, you know, I used them both if you, uh, if you were listening closely as I suspect lots of you were in the last hour. So I spoke about the West Bank and I spoke about Judea and Samaria. Uh, the Times of Israel calls it the West Bank because that's the modern name for it. But of course, we quote people who call it Judea and Samaria. Times of Israel talks about settlements uh, as opposed to communities um, because they're not sovereign territory as far as official Israel is concerned. Um, we don't talk about East Jerusalem neighborhoods as being settlements, whereas much of the international community uh, does. These are very important uh, semantic distinctions. 
Um, I used to give a lot of, I used to do reserve duty. Among the things I used to do was I used to give current affairs lectures to the army. And you're really not supposed to be political when you're talking to the army. And I used to throw in, and there's no neutral terms for Judea and Samaria and the West Bank. If you say Judea and Samaria, that automatically kind of affiliates you with one part of the spectrum. And if you say the West Bank, it affiliates you with another. And I would throw in everything just and, and hope they just got so confused that they would stop trying to worry about whether, okay, obviously I'm a journalist, so I must be left wing. Well, actually some of my family lives in settlements, so maybe I'm right wing. And my great grandfather is, you know, was a, a quite the quite well known uh, Orthodox rabbi. And you'd kind of tell them all this stuff and hope they would just maybe just listen to what you're trying to say rather than trying to pigeonhole you. So, you know, that's what I what I also try to do to some extent in in this conversation too. But in terms of of evolution, look, I'm uh, I, I, I guess the most important thing for me to say is I'm a great believer in Israel as a as a Jewish, a tolerant Jewish and democratic state. I think that's what the founding. Um, uh, Israelis had in mind. I think that's the thrust of the Declaration of Independence. I think it's a miracle that we've been able to be both a democracy with pretty equal rights for all members of the Israeli demographic uh, and a majority Jewish state. And I want us to sustain that. Um, now, one of the things that threatens Israeli democracy is if we can't find a way to separate from the Palestinians. And if you're talking about the evolution of my views, I think you'd have to be a, a, a very, very um, insistent, shall we say, I want to be polite about this, um, in not having drawn conclusions, most especially from the Second Intifada, but from the fact that we left Lebanon in 2000, uh, came back to the international border, the international community applauded, and Hezbollah took over. And now we've had a war and various rounds of conflict, and there are 100,000 plus rockets and missiles all pointed in our direction from there. And in 2005, we left Gaza, and we're back at the international line. And, um, and by the way, I think if Gaza had stayed calm after we had left, Israel might have withdrawn from much of the West Bank as well. Um, but Gaza did not stay calm. And in fact, Hamas took over fairly soon afterwards. And we've had endless rounds of conflict with Gaza. And therefore, reality has said to Israelis in the last 20 years, for sure, and that's moved the middle ground in Israel to a much more pessimistic mindset. Reality has said to Israelis, if you withdraw from territory, as the world wants you to do, so far, really bad people take over and they're just able to do you more harm from closer up. So much as I would be ready for genuine territorial compromise in the cause of peaceful coexistence, all the evidence of the last 20 years, maybe plus, is, well, withdrawing from adjacent territory so far of late has had the opposite to a, to a constructive impact. So I don't want Israel, to, I, I, you know, we were revived on the basis of a two-state solution. I don't want Israel to be running the lives of the Palestinians. And since Israeli democracy, some simple de demography requires us somehow to be able to separate from lots of Palestinians, I don't want to close the door to that possibility, but I don't see it as viable at the moment. I don't see how Israel can safely withdraw from territory. I mean, what, what territory are we talking about? We're talking about the West Bank. If Israel is gone from the West Bank, you can be fairly sure that Hamas will take over fairly quickly or some other or some combination of incredibly hostile forces. And then this country is, you know, paralyzed. You can't operate the airport. Nobody will be coming on holiday, you know, because everywhere within Israel is within rudimentary rocket range of the West Bank. So the reality is complicated and it's become unavoidable uh, to draw political conclusions of that in the last, certainly in the last 20 or so years. Thank you uh, very, very much for this uh highly informative, in-depth, really quick and personal uh, tool. Um, I'll just say there were like dozens and dozens of questions. And I want to remind you all that we'll be sending a follow-up email in which we'll try to also direct you to more reading, possibly some of David's favorite reading spaces and books and things you can uh, look at so that you can kind of further dive into these issues um, David, thank you so, so much for being with us. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Have a good morning or a good afternoon or good evening or good night, wherever you are. And we look forward to seeing you in more of our programs. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Laila Tov. Laila Tov.